Thank you, Peter. Uh, Thank you for bringing hope. You can keep that one. I have more. Uh, it's probably the, it's the rare opportunity to say that uh, a 175-page law review article is characterized as beach reading when it's a, a candidate for inclusion on the list of the longest law review articles ever published. Uh, so I, I, I thought I would do uh, – <laughs> uh, I thought I would um, – do two things. One is uh, talk through what I think are sort of four threads uh, in terms of both intellectual history and industrial and technological history that sort of formed the fabric against uh, which I was doing the research that led to this paper in the early 2000s, and then talk a little bit about how those threads in some respects came together in the research that I actually put together. So four threads. Two of them are really sort of intellectual conceptual threads, and then two of them industrial technological. The Intellectual threads were these. One was the idea of fair use as market failure. So a, a very influential paper published in 1982, so it takes us even back further into history, by Wendy Gordon, uh, a celebrated and legendary law professor still at Boston University. It was in the Columbia Law Review. And the basic idea of fair use as market failure was a very uh, sort of gap-filling negative view of fair use as the thing that solved problems in transactions in intellectual works when the market did not otherwise facilitate consensual transactions. Uh, it was very heavily influenced by law and economics thinking, and although it was not intended to be such a doctrinaire, uh, sort of market-oriented piece, I think the marketplace and the intellectual marketplace in the academy really understood it that way. Uh, and so that framing, fair use as market failure, a very transactionally oriented picture of fair use cast a very long shadow over copyright scholarship and decision making for a long time, well into the early 2000s. Even today, it's still cited as one of the paradigmatic analyses of fair use. The second thing, again chronologically as it happens, was Campbell in 1994, which revived or borrowed Judge Laval's idea of transformativeness as a touchstone of thinking about fair use, borrowing uh, from earlier work, the dissent in the Betamax case and uh, uh, the Latman report on fair use in the early 1960s, both of which had focused on the idea of productive use. So Campbell was not uh, introducing a new concept. It was really reviving an old concept. But it was introducing a phrase into the jurisprudence and philosophy and thinking about fair use in the early 90s that really started to shift the conversation in a different direction. Uh, Ten years afterwards, so 1994 to 2009, uh, 2004, the idea of transformativeness was still sort of making its way into the case law and making its way into the practice as to exactly how that was going to work on a consistent basis. But definitely the pendulum was swinging in a, a somewhat different direction. Uh, the thing that I remember about the idea of transformative use is that as with Wendy Gordon's framing of market failure for fair use, it was very much focused on the individual author, the individual work, and the individual consumer or user. This was very much still uh, sort of a one-to-one -one analysis of the specific instance and the specific case, very much a classically liberal uh, tra traditional framing of copyright disputes. Shifting from intellectual foundations to sort of industrial and technological foundations in uh, 1998, the DMCA, uh, about which we've now heard a lot of the backdoor his background history, uh, it comes into effect. It comes into effect as it happened right at the moment that I was starting my law teaching career after 10 years of private practice in uh, California. And the idea of the service provider has this critical role in the statute. The notice and takedown regime is introduced, and people are left to wonder who is a service provider? What are the obligations of service providers? How is the notice and takedown regime actually going to work? In in practice, what happens when you start to scale the notice and takedown regime from a one work at a time, one author at a time, one copyright owner at a time kind of system, which was largely the way the world was framed when the legislation was being discussed, quickly people realized that this is going to get scaled uh, and we're going to have large scale sort of batch processing in some respect of notice and takedown problems. And then what do we do then? Uh, it, of course, not uh, coincidentally, uh, this week we know we're still wrestling with this problem, uh, almost in exactly those terms. Uh, but 
to substitute the phrase service provider for gatekeeper, and you see the, 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 the uh, alignment of the technological and statutory development with the problem that, that Peter was uh, describing. And then the fourth of these threads was the most sort of concrete and tangible and immediate one of them, which is Napster. Uh, and so the very first time I came to this law school and came to a program and spoke on a panel in this room was a panel about Napster that Peter organized, and Mike Carroll, who's now in the faculty here, was at that time uh, planning to become a law professor, and that's where I met Mike. And we were all sort of in the, like, what, is, what are we going to do, and what does Napster mean, and who does what, and so forth. It was this crisis, because a lot of these threads were sort of converging, and in particular, they were converging around this question of personal use and private use, which was a concept that had been lurking in the background of copyright discussions at least since the Betamax litigation in the early 1980s. But then copyright discussions and policy making, it kind of wandered off into other directions. The transformativeness idea from the Campbell case sort of reinforced the marginalizing of personal use. But Napster, it just roared back, right? Because you had millions and millions of people around the world who discovered this amazing way to get free stuff instantly and claimed that they were entitled to do that because they were making personal use or private use and somehow that uh, was uh, qualified under the doctrine of fair use. So, so now you have this problem of scale uh, that was confronting all of us uh, right in the face, and we didn't have the, the, uh, the policy tools and the doctrinal tools to, uh, to wrestle with that. So those were the, the four sort of threads that uh, I had sort of in front of me when I started this research project. It would be nice, transitioning to my contribution, it would be nice to say that I took those four threads and wrote up a grand synthesis to solve all of the relevant problems that are derived from those, but I didn't. Um, uh, what I actually did uh, is I was a relatively junior, uh, untenured faculty member at that time, uh, relatively naive, uh, all things considered, in the ways of academics. I did not understand, really, that law professors are supposed to actually solve the world's problems. I thought my job was simply to understand the world's problems. So I asked what I thought was the essential question sort of underneath uh, the Napster problem, which is, is file sharing, as it was called sometimes, or file swapping, as it was uh, more pejoratively called sometimes, is that lawful? Is it fair use? I really genuinely just wanted to understand what the law told us about the answer to that question. So as Peter said, I read all of the fair use case law. And I read all of the fair use case law before it was fair use case law. I read it before it was part of the statute. I read it as part of the, the antecedents in US copyright law. I read an enormous amount of the English material uh, that before everything came to the US. And uh, I did not have any presupposition that uh, sort, of doc, uh, sort of disciplinary patterns or social practices or anything of that nature was the key that would unlock this mystery. Uh, oftentimes, law professors go into research pro projects having identified some method or tool or theory from some other field and saying, how would it work if I applied this logic of economics or this logic of psychology and then investigated the corresponding uh, legal pattern, and I, I didn't do that at all. I just read all these cases and studied the legislative history and really looked hard at the Napster litigation and all of the opinions coming out of that. And it gradually dawned on me that uh, sort of people operating in groups, informal groups, loosely affiliated groups, but definable groups nonetheless, were playing a big part in how courts were reasoning to their outcomes, and that played a big part in how courts were reasoning to their outcomes going way back going back centuries, not just going back in the years since the statute, the current statute was adopted in the late 1970s. That was really interesting. And I don't remember the, the day and the, the, the time when the light bulb went off over my head, but it was this process of something crystallizing in my head that I was putting my finger on something that hadn't really been identified in the literature or in the cases as such up to that point. Well, that's pretty interesting. So then I went looking to see if anybody else had talked about this turned out in law, IP law, or really in any other area of law, not so much. But if you look at the social science literature, I found a lot of interesting things. And so all the back part of this paper is confirming that my instinct about what's happening in creative practice in copyright law is aligned with what people had observed in linguistics and 
observed in psychology and observed in sociology and had observed in parts of economics. These different communities of people themselves not necessarily talking to one another, and they were obviously talking in different vocabularies of their own, but they were clearly talking about the same kinds of things. And they were talking about these kinds of things in an affirming, positive sense. That is, here was a way to borrow social science research to reinforce my initial instinct and to, to combine those, in, the instinct and the aligned research as a way of putting out an affirmative theory of fair use, not just a gap-filling, transaction-solving theory of fair use, but an affirmative theory of why fair use is not simply there, but why fair use is a good thing, and why fair use is a good thing for the same reasons that copyright as a whole is a good thing, so that fair use becomes not an exception to the structure of the statute, but it's really an integral part of the fabric of the statute. That was a point that had been made previously, so folks like Terry Fisher at Harvard and Lloyd Weinreb at Harvard and a couple of other people had written about fair use in those terms, but in much more abstract sort of philosophical ways, and I was trying to backfill with some what, what lawyers call data, which is uh, the actual decisions uh, of actual courts. Uh, as Peter says, uh, we had gotten acquainted because I had been invited to this earlier program here uh, at WCL on Napster, and uh, I'm a young faculty, I'm a junior, I would say not young, but junior faculty member at that time, and I'm looking for advice and mentorship, and so I know Peter is interested in this stuff, and he's interested in the things about Napster. I have no idea about what's otherwise happening here at in Peter's uh, career and what's happening at, I just sent him a copy of the paper uh, in all innocence saying, you know, what do you think of this? Love to get your reaction and, you know, maybe you'll write me a tenure letter uh, <laughs> down the road if you like it. Uh, and he, I remember sitting in my office and I get this phone call from Peter who is essentially bouncing off the walls with excitement. Uh, and, and so he told me, you know, that, that connects up to the end of the story that, that Peter was, was telling. I have to say, I, I at least at that point had no idea that anything that was part of my paper would be eventually baked in, in some respect, into this best practices project. So that, of course, is entirely Peters and Pat's doing and everyone else who has collaborated with them. They were very generous along the way to invite me, uh, as well as a few other folks, to be on boards of legal advisors to participate in dialogues about making each of many of these statements uh, concrete uh, and so forth. And so, uh, you know, back in at Pittsburgh, the dean has the periodic survey of the faculty to you know, how often has your work been cited by courts? <laughs> right, how often has your work been cited in legislative histories? How often have you testified in Congress of the classic modes of law reform? And I have nothing whatsoever to offer on any of that. Uh, but it's been an amazing ride, mostly to watch, occasionally to, to kibitz, as uh, the research that I did sort of built into a larger movement and became part of what I think of as a very significant uh, not controversy free, but very significant uh, form of sort of modern age law reform uh, where it sort of gave some agency to the people whose interests and rights and stakes really are on the front lines and empowering them to take control of the idea of fair use as a collective, as an institution, not just in a one to one sense. Uh, to sort of be a part of the conversation about creation, creativity, distribution, access, all of those things on a robust basis rather than uh, in that sort of more traditional, exceptional uh, market transaction one-to-one -one basis, which was so limiting for so long. <laughs>